Hello everybody. So um, this is the second screencast uh, of three um, focused on the topic of Mendelian genetics. What I'd like to continue doing in the second screencast is ta to talk a little bit more about Mendel's experimental system, um, discuss the principle of segregation, and the basic structure and function of Punnett squares. There are a lot of great things about Mendel's experimental system. Um, as I mentioned in the previous screencast, um, the, the pea plant itself um, is a really good subject or a very good model organism to use for genetic studies. And Mendel chose very wisely when he used it to try to determine the rules of heredity. Um, Mendel's experimental system, um, in addition to his great choice in a, in a general model organism, um, he, he also was very careful. He was a very careful experimenter. And one of the things that he did when he started his experiments um, to discover the rules of heredity was he used pea plants that he considered to be true breeding or pure lines. And what this means is that when a um, purple flowered pea plant fertilizes itself, that is the pollen grains from one flower fertilize the egg cells in the ovary of the same flower. What is always produced in the offspring are purple flowered plants. So he started all of his experiments um, in the parental generations with true breeding or pure line plants. Okay. This way he could make sure that he um, that he could control what his matings would look like um, in, in a very, very precise way. What Mendel was observing, though he didn't realize it at the time, was when he was looking at and breeding purple flowered plants and white flowered plants, was he was observing the gene for flower color and that there were two alternative forms of that gene in the pea plants that he was looking for. There was a allele that codes for purple flowers and there was an allele that codes for white flowers. And that the allele for purple flowers was dominant over the allele for white flowers. Okay, so here is your pair of homologous chromosomes that are the same length, have the same centromere position, and contain the same genes, though, as I mentioned before in previous lectures um, in class, there may be alternative forms of the, the, that gene or those genes on that chromosome in, on the homologous pair. So in a heterozygous individual, an individual that has two different alleles for the same gene, um, this is what um, they would, their homologous pair of chromosomes were, would look like. In an organism, in a true breeding organism, um, or a pure line, what um, Mendel did in establishing those lines was he was making certain that on a homologous pair of chromosomes with the gene for flower color, that um, the alleles for that gene were the same. Okay, So in those pure line purple flowered plants that when he allowed them to self only produce purple flowered plants, the, alle the, the plant had two alleles for the gene for flower color, both of those alleles being purple. Okay. So when he um, was crossing these purple flowered plants with white flowered plants in the parental generation of uh, crosses in which he was only um, following one trait or monohybrid crosses. What he was doing was he was taking um, purple flowered plants. This is a cell of um, a purple flower plant, plant in the G1 phase of um, the cell cycle. And during meiosis, the only types of gametes that this purple flower true breeding individual would produce would be gametes that possessed the allele for purple flowers. Okay, this is why it's so important to understand meiosis to truly understand genetics, uh, uh, excuse me, and to truly understand Mendelian genetics. 
So if you look, all of the gametes that are produced by meiosis in this purple flower plant had the allele for purple flowers. Okay. So therefore, all the gametes had the dominant allele, P. In this case, the dominant allele will always be um, denoted as a capital letter. And, um, and in this case, it's a capital P. Likewise, in the white flowered plants, okay, in the G1 phase of the cell cycle, this is what um, one of the cells would look like that was about to undergo meiosis um, in this white flower plant. After meiosis, all of the gametes produced by individuals that were true breeding or pure lined plants, all of the gametes would possess the allele for white flowers, not purple flowers. In this case, it's the recessive allele and is denoted by a small p. Okay. I should have mentioned also up here, when I say that the allele for purple flowers is dominant over the allele for white flowers, what I should have said was that means that if the dominant allele is present on one of the homologous chromosomes, at least in these particular experiments we're talking about, it would mask the allele for white flowers. So this individual who is heterozygous, okay, for the heterozygous dominant for purple flowers, okay, this individual would have purple flowers. So back to the gametes. So these are the gametes that would be produced by a white flowered parent. Um, it has uh, each of these parents have both um, both ha both of the uh, chromosomes in the homologous pair possess the recessive allele for white flowers, and all of the gametes that these individuals produce would have the recessive allele that codes for white flowers. So now, when he took gametes or pollen grains from the purple flowered individual and he placed those pollen grains on the female reproductive structure of white flowered individuals in which the egg cells all possess the allele for white flowers, what he found was that when those um, organisms reproduce with one another and produce seeds, when he grew those seeds up, all of the individuals in that next generation had purple flowers. Okay, so here's the F1 generation, the first filial generation from a breeding of two pure, pure lined plants. And what he found was that all the individuals had purple flowers. This very quickly dispelled the idea of blended inheritance. Okay, and so what he found was that all the individuals had, um, eventually he found this, had um, a dominant um, allele for purple flowers and a recessive allele for recessive flowers, uh, excuse me, for, yeah, for, um, for white flowers in um, in the cells of all of the progeny. Okay, therefore, the dominant allele masked the recessive allele, and all the individuals had purple flowers. Okay, then what he did was he allowed the um, the F1 generation um, individuals to fertilize themselves. Okay, so he allowed all of the F1 generation flowers, he allowed the sperm cells that can, uh, from the pollen grains to actually fertilize the egg cells within the ovary of exactly the same flower. And so what he did was he allowed that to happen. Each one of these flowers would then produce progeny or seeds, and then he grew those seeds up. And what he found was that he said, essentially in the resulting second filial or F2 generation, the ratio of uh, purple flowered to white flowered plants was three to one. When he really grew up all of the seeds, okay, so he allowed, mul he did multiple breedings and he allowed multiple individuals from the F1 generation to self-fertilize. And what he did was when he looked at the seeds, he said, okay, how many of the resulting seeds 
were plants that produced purple flowers and how many um, uh, seeds from these self-fertilizations when allowed to grow produce white flower plants. And he found there were 705 purple flower plants and 224 white flower plants in this F2 or our second filial generation. And this was basically a ratio of three to one. So he used a very quantitative approach here. This was where he, he sort of discovered the principle of segregation. Okay. And the principle of segregation states that in many species, individuals have two alleles of each gene. The principle states that the alleles of each gene separate so that each egg or sperm cells receives only one of them. Okay, this will become evident in the next slide I'm going to show you in um, the next screencast. So I'll see you in just a second.